Is Ethereum actually dead or are we on our way to all time highs and beyond? In this video, I'm going to break down five catalysts that I believe will cause Ethereum to go to all time highs and follow in the path of Bitcoin that Bitcoin's doing right now. Before we jump into Ethereum and, and the catalyst that I'm going to lay out, I want to kind of break down what causes an asset to go up in, in Ethereum's case and how some of the moves that they're making in their roadmap are creating this uh, supply and demand and how it may create the catalyst for what we're looking for. So in every asset is is we have a supply and a demand curve. OK, so increased supply in the market, decreased demand, right, causes basically low price too much supply little demand creates low price high demand and low supply creates high prices okay so think of this as you know price quantity so in ethereum's case uh, it had a problem where it was proof of work and so as time went on more ethereum was hitting the market and doge has this problem right now it has an inflation mechanism the us dollar has this problem it has an inflation mechanism the us dollar you know, we've printed 80% of them in the last five years. And so, of course, everything is appreciating in relation to the US dollar because one divided by infinity gets as close to zero as possible, right? That's every fiat currency in the world, unless you have some sort of burn mechanism or buyback mechanism, uh, which we currently don't. With It's kind of uncapped. Ethereum had the same problem. Doge has a similar problem. Bitcoin doesn't have that problem. Every four years, it gets halved, right? You have the Bitcoin halving cycle. So as as time goes on, less and less Bitcoin are hitting the markets and less and less Bitcoin are getting produced by blocks uh, from miners. Ethereum had that problem, but since they uh, changed over from proof of work to proof of stake and they did an upgrade called the merge, they introduced a mechanism that burned excess Ethereum from fees. So I'm going to outline these five catalysts right here for you guys. And they are uh, the first catalyst that I'm going to cover are is the burn mechanism. The second catalyst is L2s. Uh, and then the third catalyst is Eigenlayer and, and, and basically how that's pulling uh, a lot of Ethereum off the market. And I'll kind of break down what that is if you guys have never heard of that. Uh, the fourth catalyst that I think is coming is the Ethereum ETF. And then the last one, uh, and this isn't so much an, a, a catalyst for um, decreasing supply, but I think this will increase demand is EIP 844 or sorry, 4844. Uh, so this is an Ethereum improvement protocol uh, or proposal, sorry, and then that gets voted on by by um, uh, by Ethereum holders and uh, people on the network, and so they try to create a consensus on whether or not they they get that approved. But what EIP four eight four four does is it introduces um, uh, a proposal that uh, called dank sharding that'll basically uh, in improved transaction throughput from 15 where we're at and with a, maybe 100 transactions per second with L2s to hopefully get to 100,000 using blob transactions, some other things. So I'm going to get to that uh, kind of near the end. But at the very end, we're going to go in the technical analysis of Ethereum, where we're at, kind of some historical analysis of Ethereum and why we may be going to all time highs. So the first thing we I want to talk about before we get, jump into um, the burn mechanism, how that works is this thread I kind of I, I put out uh, back in November 4th. This was on Twitter. So on November 4th, I introduced this thread. It's basically called Don't Fuck This Cycle Up Again, a thread of helpful helpful tips. Basically, what I saw was everything was both breaking out of multi-year bear market trends. So everything was breaking out of these accumulation ranges. Your only goal is to get in a position and ride the trend until it gets you fork. If you're not on Twitter, if you're not following me on Twitter, it's just up here, um, uh, x.com slash Jacob Canfield, twitter.com slash Jacob Canfield. I, I post all kinds of threads like this, but this is a market condition where you can typically get a win rate of 90% with an RR over two. Always be scanning. So here was my thesis back in November. Bitcoin spotted uh, ETF approval will bring in a wave of new money. So that's tra traditional market, uh, especially in the ETF stock market. They're going to see the ETFs come out and they're going to see the overperformance and they're going to pile in, which is going to create FOMO. And then everybody's going to be looking for the next Bitcoin, right? Uh, right here. Then you've got the Ethereum spot approval. Uh, again, ETF approval. And I think that'll gigapump ETH in the ERC20 ecosystem and everything surrounding DeFi. And then a lot of that's going to trickle into L2s, their ecosystems, Arbitrum, Optimism, ZK Sync era, a lot of these new L2s that are coming out, I think Blast, a few others. Uh, and then, you know, I did have a thesis around Solana. Um, and whether or not you believe in Solana or Ethereum, I think holding both of them in your portfolio is smart. It's kind of like Apple 
and Microsoft, right? One has great UI UX, one has great, um, you know, uh, coding development, uh, all kinds of stuff. So uh, Solana to me is like the Apple. Uh, Ethereum is kind of like the Microsoft. You know, Microsoft owns GitHub. Focus on developers. Uh, Solana, it, you know, it used to be kind of a VC chain backed by Sam Bankman Fried and FTX. It's kind of gotten rid of that, hardened itself during the bear market. So I'm a believer in both, and there's no reason why you can't be. Uh, you, you're more than you know welcome to pick a side, but so a couple other narratives: real-world assets, airdrops for protocols. Uh, you know, mess around with protocols. So all these things I still believe are true. But there's a really cool thing from Secrets of Crypto highlighted up here on Twitter. Another really great follow, and I I gave credit in this thread. But this is kind of the path to all season. Most people didn't believe that phase two was going to happen. They don't think that Ethereum's here. And I'm going to lay out five catalysts and why I think that that. Ethereum still is going to have a pretty massive bullish market, especially in their L2s. But so the phase two here, usually phase one, Bitcoin pumps, uh, the money trickles down into phase two, Ethereum, and then the money flows into large caps, you know, top 20 to 50 coins. And then the last phase is those small caps, the kind of the two, like 150 or probably probably 80 to like 500. A lot of those go crazy. And that's where you can see like 100x to 300x. Um, uh, trades on some of those smaller cap coins. And so kind of jumping on some of those narratives, GameFi, AI, I think that's where it's at. So let's lay out the five narratives, uh, why I think phase two is coming sooner than we think. So the first one is the burn mechanism on, on Ethereum that I laid out here, right? So the burn mechanism. So what is the burn mechanism? Well, uh, the EIP 1559 introduced this burn, burn mechanism. Un under the original Ethereum gas fee system, users bid a random amount of money. Under EIP 1559, it required that the network burn all Ether tokens used to pay base fees. This procedure will reduce the total, total supply of Ether tokens, making Ether more scarce and therefore more valuable. So most people don't know this. It used to be inflationary. Now if Ethereum is getting to be more deflationary, right? So what is that doing? It's increasing demand and decreasing supply, right? So it's, it's moving to the left side, right? So it's moving to the left upper quadrant because it's decreasing supply. Uh, and that's what the burn mechanism is doing. Now what's interesting about this burn mechanism is it's not just Ethereum. All the layer twos that we have, Arbitrism, Optimism, Blast, uh, ZK Sync Air, all these L2 rollups, uh, that help to scale uh, Ethereum off the base layer also also burn Ethereum. Specifically for every transaction on an L2, a user pays a transaction fee. The L2 keeps a portion of that fee around a 24% margin. So all these all these optimistic rollups like or sorry like Optimism, Arbitrum, all these rollups with different you know theories on how to scale it, they keep 24%. The Ethereum network receives the remaining 76 percent for every transaction sent by an l2 the ethereum network also burns a small portion of total eth supply as a result incremental activity on ethereum layer 2s directly accrues value to eth so these l2s directly you know accrue value to eth because of that burn mechanism so let's take a look at that burn mechanism so there's a website called ultrasound.money and they show you this right so in the last 515 days since the merge Okay, the merge was this proposal that where the, the proposal went live. We have seen 1.387 million ETH burned and 1 million issued to the validators on the network, right? So we moved from proof of work where uh, miners were mining it to 32 ETH on a validator can validate can, you know, the transactions. And now, uh, you know, so now we've seen a minus 0.2% per year supply reduction of Ethereum. So we're actually burning Ethereum. So we're actually becoming a deflationary cryptocurrency similar to Bitcoin, except now we're even more because we're actually decreasing the supply year over year. So since the merge, that's what's happened. So you can see since the burn, right? So, so supply was steadily increasing, steadily increasing, steadily increasing, boom, the merge happened. And now we're steadily going down. So we're actually reversing. And you can see this basically in the last, um, you know, one day or whatever. Uh, we've burned $1,200, $1,200 ETH in the last 24 hours, uh, which is, you know, incredible. So as you move down, you can actually see uh, the top apps uh, that, that do this, right? So if we go to since the merge, you can actually see just transferring ETH has burned 88,000 ETH. 
Uh, Uniswap has burned 84,000 ETH. Tether, the stable coin, USDT, has burned 63,000 ETH. Arbitrum, the L2, and this is what I was going back to, the L2, has burned 28,000 ETH. Just MetaMask and OpenSea have combined 48,000 ETH. So all these different L2s and, and dApps on Ethereum are burning ETH. So again, we go back to this supply demand chart, uh, L2s and burn, and we see the, de you know, the demand going up because the supply is getting reduced. It's going down to the left, right? And so demand's increasing, supply's going down. So we're moving to that left, si left side, which should hopefully increase price, okay? So we've got that, we've got this burn. So the next thing we've got, that third, that third mechanism is eigenlayer. And eigenlayer is a brand new uh, technology and innovation on Ethereum. Ethereum DeFi was kind of dead, right? Solana DeFi took over. A lot of cool stuff happening over there. We had MEV bots and flash bots on Ethereum. So it kind of became dead uh, overall. So Eigenlayer, I just wrote a very, very long thread on Eigenlayer, liquid restaking tokens, airdrop far farming, and all kinds of stuff. So what I think with Eigenlayer is, is it's pulling massive amounts of supply of ETH on the market. And we go back to here, right? What are some catalysts that are going to decrease supply to increase price? Eigenlayer is massive. Okay, so Eigenlayer is um, one of those things that comes along that really kind of uh, causes a massive catalyst, but it's a delayed impact catalyst, similar to the Bitcoin ETF and Bitcoin halvings. So Eigenlayer, right now we've got Lido, which is a liquid staking uh, protocol. You stake your ETH on Lido, and then Lido will stake your ETH onto uh, Ethereum validators and then reward you with a percentage year, so like an APR. So it's kind of think of, think of it like a dividend. You earn more ETH the more uh, Ethereum you have staked. Um, and so that's what Lido did. So what Ethereum um, liquid restaking is, Eigenlayer kind of introduced this new proposal called restaking. So you can actually take your STETH and restake it onto Eigenlayer, and then Eigenlayer will restake it into other consensus protocols uh, across the, the ecosystem to earn more rewards. And then it, it, it increases all kinds of new applications in DeFi. And they just reopened their vaults from February 5th to February 9th, and then they just reclosed them. But in the span since, they, since Eigenlayer has been in their testnet phase, they've uh, managed to pull in almost $6 billion worth of Ethereum. So again, that's Ethereum that's getting pulled off the market. And then what's happening is all kinds of other liquid staking protocols are, are jumping up and introducing all kinds of new mechanisms that you can use your Ethereum with to, to stake it on Eigenlayer to, to add into this DeFi ecosystem. So if you want to read more about DeFi, um, um, Eigenlayer, what they do and how they help to, you know, uh, secure the network through this Eigenlayer protocol. You can read more about it in their white paper. And all the links that I have in this video, I'm going to put in the in the comments on YouTube. So if you're if you want that, you can. But just taking a look here at the Eigenlayer app, you can actually see a lot of these staked protocols. They're called liquid staking protocols. Coinbase, Stakewise, Origin, Lido. So all these L2s, like even Base Layer, all of these things. Um, are gonna benefit Ethereum and these staking protocols where you stake your Ethereum, this pulls Ethereum out of the market, right? So it's not being used to buy, sell, it's not being used in, in the market. So again, it's reducing the supply. So Eigenlayer, I think, is a pretty massive um, thing. As we look here, this is on DeFi Llama. You can actually see by Ethereum, uh, the, uh, the TVL. Uh, and you can see Lido, 25.8, Three six billion, but Eigenlayer restaking right here six point four seven billion, and they're still in testnet, uh, right? You could see Rocket Pool liquid staking three point two billion. You could see uh, you come down here Binance staked ETH, Mantle staked ETH, uh, EtherFi. That's one of those protocols um, that is uh, liquid restaking. So the restaking Puffer Finance. That's a that's a um, a protocol from Binance. Uh, you can see Stater Labs, Coinbase Wrap. So all these staking and restaking, um, KelpDAO, a lot of these are the ones that I mentioned. These are all pulling Ethereum off the market. And again, we go back to here, is it decreasing supply? So that's why I think the Eigenlayer is a massive catalyst because it's pulling Ethereum off in droves. Like massive amounts of Ethereum are getting pulled off to the tune of $6.471 billion. Uh, dollars worth of worth of Ethereum. Now, this could still be like some of those liquid staking tokens like uh, STETH and Coinbase ETH and all those things. But so that's that's why I think Eigenlayer is huge. The next one is the Ethereum ETF. Now, the Ethereum ETF is uh, similar to the Bitcoin ETF, right? 
It's a spot back to Ethereum ETF. So anything that goes into these, this is a traditional market uh, ETF. And so anybody that's buying in the tr traditional markets, they buy the ETF, then that ETF has to buy the underlying spot asset, similar to the bit, you know, the BlackRock, the VanEck. And we've got the same people, VanEck, Hashdex, Grayscale, BlackRock, Fidelity, all going to do the same thing. They're going to they're trying to get their ETFs approved. They want to be the first ones. And then it's going to be a bidding war for um, who has the lowest fees to try and draw as much at, you know interest into that. So I think that Ethereum uh, ETF is going to be similar to the first uh, three massive catalyst for pulling Ethereum off the market because it's just going to be a constant uh, traditional market spot bid from institutions, uh, family offices, millionaires, billionaires around the world that are going to want um, exposure to these asset classes. Bitcoin's number one, Ethereum's number two, and that. So the 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 date to watch for is May 23rd. That's like the latest date, uh, the final deadline for Van Eck. And I don't. I think this one's probably going to be approved. And when they approved Bitcoin, they approved all 11 at the same time. And um, uh, the SEC's predecessor, he has already said that Ethereum is not a security. It's already been stated. Solana is kind of up in the air. So that's your risk with Solana that is that it is a security based on kind of the how the, the how we test uh, for security. But I think the Ethereum ETF is just as massive a catalyst as the first ones that I talked about. And then the last thing that I think is 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 a good catalyst. This isn't going to increase. Um, this isn't going to decrease supply, but what I think this will do is I think it'll increase demand. So that again pulls us to the left of the chart, and that is um, the, uh, the EIP four eight four four, and that is uh, and that's the Cancun upgrade. Now, what's interesting about EIP four eight four four is it introduces this new type of transaction called a blob carrying transaction, and what that's going to do is that's going to decrease um, Ethereum's transaction costs quite a bit. Even still now in this bull market, especially when we saw the ETH 404 NFT protocol come out, we saw that the uh, gas fees were crazy. They were like $140, $150 just to do a transaction. So what this does is it is it tries to um, is it tries to de increase storage, but, but by making the price super super cheap, and it and it's kind of a short term transaction, and it doesn't go straight to the EVM contract. Uh, and so what this does is, is it's trying to create this increase, this concept called dank sharding, which is supposed to increase the transactions per second of Ethereum to 100,000, considering L1 plus L2s as a whole. L1 is a layer one, that's the Ethereum protocol. L2 are all these rollups that I've talked about, Optimism, um, you know, ZK Sync Era, Arbitrum, all those things. And then we've got even proto uh, dank sharding named after the two uh, Ethereum researchers. But it, it introduces this new concept called blob carrying transactions uh, and that's that's what I think is the fifth catalyst for Ethereum. And I think that is where we can see, you know, Visa, where we can get to that level of, of scaling that Ethereum can actually handle massive transactions, you know, trillion dollar settlement layers for uh, real world assets. Real world assets is a huge um, narrative coming up. You've got Ondo, you've got some of these protocols that are that are working on the um, the real world asset narrative. So those are the five catalysts that I think are going to make Ethereum, you know, bullish over the next year to two years. And I think it's going to follow in uh, in Bitcoin's footsteps. Now, he, let's jump into the, some of the technical analysis and kind of show you what we're looking for to see that catalyst. So this is the Ethereum Bitcoin chart. So this is Ethereum uh, in relation to Bitcoin. And so what we've been looking for and what we've been waiting for is Ethereum to break out of this downtrend that it's had basically since August of 2022. We kind of hit uh, we kind of hit this same uh, resistance level 0.8, same resistance level from over here. Just haven't been able to break above this this zone. And what's really interesting is that no cryptocurrency has ever made a, uh, a successive all time high against Ethereum or uh, sorry, against Bitcoin. So can Ethereum do it, uh, you know, with the ETF, with some of these catalysts? I think Ethereum is setting itself up for a wildly, wildly bullish market. And even still, Bitcoin has broken out pretty massively and it's managed to kind of go sideways. Uh, I mean, it's it's downtrended a bit uh, since since 2022 against Bitcoin, you know, down 40 percent. So it was much better to hold Bitcoin. But in general, it's still not been too bad, especially for the, the run that Bitcoin's been on since October. We're basically flat. Right. So this is, you know, it, 
holding Ethereum was basically just the exact same as holding Bitcoin since October of 23. And, and we had the entire run up for, for Bitcoin. So I don't think it's been terrible. What we don't want to see is we do not want to see us lose this level here. Because if we lose this, lose this level here, then most likely what we'll see is we'll see you know a fall back to, because ranges are ranges. If we lose this support zone, we may see it fall all the way back and, and Bitcoin may go crazy. You know, in a hyper parabolic and Ethereum may lose its value against it. I don't think that's gonna happen for the reasons that I laid out, but it's possible. So you gotta keep that in mind. Now, what we can see on the USDT chart is we had a very long accumulation phase on USDT. Uh, same same level, August 22, we had that massive breakdown. And then I think Ethereum has kind of been uh, underperforming because we had a lot of Ethereum being held by institutions that went bankrupt after the Luna collapse. You had Celsius, you had FTX, uh, you had uh, Blockfolio, all these other things which were associated, Alameda. And so the Ethereum has been steadily being sold. Even um, the one of the founders of Ethereum is selling uh, their Ethereum. The Ethereum Foundation is selling their Ethereum. So that's kind of kept the price of Ethereum uh, down uh, in, in relation to the rest of the market that's been outperforming. Like if you look at the Sol ETH chart, uh, Solana has been uh, massively outperforming Ethereum and we kind of reached a, uh, a kind of a resistance level on the Sol ETH chart. But you know, Solana in general oh, since October has massively outperformed Ethereum, which uh, you know, almost 400% increase in value by holding Solana versus Ethereum. I, we went from $8 to $100. Ethereum's went from like, you know, 1,000 to 2,000. So, you know, 50% uh, up versus, you know, a 10X on Ethereum, on Solana. Is that gonna ca continue to hold true? I don't really think so, especially with the Ethereum ETF, unless Solana gets an ETF. Um, but if we do break out above this above this 0 0.056 um, resistance level on Sol ETH, I think Solana may be a better hold. But again, I hold both in my portfolio, and I and I don't see any any reason not to. So, <clears throat> what we want to see on Sol uh, or sorry Ethereum on the USDT chart is uh, we broke out of this multi-week resistance level, and now we're we're heading kind of up, right? So the big thing that I look for are the 0.618 resistance zones. You know, so this was the level that I was looking at for resistance and it correlates perfectly to our weekly resistance right here. So I think 3350 is our first our first level that we want to maybe consider hedging, taking some profits with, okay, right here. But in general, with this catalyst that I've laid out, if Bitcoin's continuing and we've got a reduction in supply and now we're going to have an Ethereum uh, ETF coming up in May, I think that you know a 1618 even higher. So, you know, all time highs at 5,000, and I've got my eyes on you know 7,500, even 10,000 dollars per Ethereum, and maybe even you know 15,000 dollars or higher. I think that's totally doable over the next one to two years, maybe even maybe even longer. I'm very patient when it comes to my investments, um, but I think that. The, for the reasons that I laid out, the technical analysis, everything is pointing to we're in a strong uptrend. You just have to be a little patient with Ethereum. Um, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you want me to dive in depth with anything else even more, let me know. If you uh, enjoyed this content, um, consider giving me a, you know, a subscribe down below. Hit like and then leave in the comments what you think. Do you think we're headed to that $15,000 level? Are you bearish on Ethereum? What are your thoughts? Um, and then the next video, I'm gonna be doing a airdrop tutorial. I'm gonna try and uh, farm a bunch of different protocols, show you kind of how I go about that. And uh, if you guys want any more types of video or content or price uh, analysis or predictions or forecasts, let me know in the comments what you guys would like to see. I'm open to suggestions and I'll see you guys on the next video. Thanks.